If I only knew. I can't tell you how many times I've said that here over the last two and a half years or so since I've been with Pioneer Bible Translators. One of the biggest moments was uh, back in August of 2012, I had the opportunity to take the trip of a lifetime. My wife Ann and I went to Papua New Guinea. Now, Papua New Guinea is uh, sort of north of Australia and south of Indonesia, and pretty much if you put your finger on the globe where we are and put it on the opposite side of the world, that's about where Papua New Guinea is. It's a long way from here. We were in the regional capital of Medang, and they put us in a pickup truck and drove us about 20 miles north on the only road in that part of the country. And they pulled over to the side of the road next to this, you know, in the middle of this jungle. And they said, well, here we are. And I thought to myself, where's here? <laughs> and uh, then all of a sudden, several Papua New Guineans who did not speak any English came out. And they began talking with us in Tokfusin and gestured for us to follow. And so we ascended the mountain to the village of Montanao, where we spent the next several days living in a bush village. That first night was the most incredible experience. I remember that I got to sit there on the mat of honor with Peter and uh, Augusta, his wife, was preparing the meal. And I remember that as they, were, as they were fixing the meal, I remember just sitting there thinking, like, I don't speak their language, they don't speak mine. You know, what, what do I do? And I just was kind of just soaking it all in. And as someone who has applied for the television show Survivor ten times, it was a sublime moment for me to be in that place at that time. But one of the, one of the most memorable experiences of my time there in the village happened when they served us the meal. Uh, I, I have a picture here of actually the second night. This is Peter and I sitting on that mat and uh, some of the food that they had set in front of us. The night before it was too dark to take any pictures, but that night before was my first night eating in, in this bush village. And I remember they handed me this plate and this plate was absolutely full of food. I didn't know what any of it was, but it was full of food. And I, I remember thinking to myself as I looked at this, there's no way I'm going to finish all this. There's just far too much food on this plate. I have no chance of making it all the way through this. But I remembered my training from when I was in Bible college, that when you travel and they stick food in front of you, you finish what they put in front of you. So I set about the task of trying to finish this mammoth, this gargantuan amount of food. And I ate and I ate and I ate until I was fuller than I ever had been at any Thanksgiving I had ever attended. And finally, when I just had done all that I could, I set down the plate, and there was a little bit of greens left in the corner, and something that looked like a potato but wasn't, but that was, I, I couldn't go any further. And I set the plate down on, that, on the palm leaf uh, in front, and I was horrified at what happened next, because Augusta picked up my plate and handed it to the next person. And I thought, oh, if I only knew, <laughs> if I only knew that they only had two or three plates and everybody had to share. But because I was the honored guest, I got to eat first and eat all I wanted. And then the next person got to eat. Well, the following night was the one that you saw the picture of. And the young man who sat off to my right was very pleased that I didn't eat nearly as much as I had the night before. But I can tell you, this was just one of many, many experiences that I have had over the past two and a half years since I started serving with Pioneer Bible Translators, where I thought to myself, man, if I only knew this has been such an experience in my own ignorance for me. There have been so many things at various stages in my life that I think I really would have benefited from if, if I had only known a little sooner. And so given the opportunity to share with you this morning, I just thought to myself, what are some things that would have changed my life and ministry if I only knew them a little sooner? And this morning, the text is from Matthew chapter 4. And I think that's a, an interesting thing that happens right there where it, it, it's interesting what Matthew does. In, in Matthew, uh, both John the Baptist and Jesus begin preaching with the exact same words. In, in Matthew chapter 3, verse 2, John the Baptist preaches, and his message is, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Matthew has Jesus' preaching beginning in chapter 4, verse 17, with the exact same words. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near, or at hand, depending on your translation. But what happens between those two moments is, I think, significant. There's, there's preparation. There, there are things that Jesus experiences that get him ready for the ministry that God has for him. And the first is his baptism. Boy, talk about a mountaintop experience. I, mean, I, don't know how, I don't know how cool your baptism was if you've been baptized, but certainly being there in the water, having the Holy Spirit descend like a dove, and hearing God speak from heaven that he's pleased with you, is a pretty good, that's a pretty good mountaintop experience. But Jesus comes down off that mountaintop really quickly as we're told that the first thing that happens immediately after this, this momentous moment in his, in his relationship with God is that the Spirit leads him into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. 
It's the spirit that leads him to be tempted by the devil. And that tells us that while the devil has something at stake in tempting Jesus, so does God. There's a reason why God takes Jesus to that moment to face these temptations that the enemy presents him with. And I thought, what are the things that Jesus learned? What are the experiences that Jesus had that helps him be ready for the ministry of the kingdom, for the invasion of heaven, the kingdom of heaven, onto earth? Like, what does Jesus learn in these moments? And I thought, well, what is it about these temptations? Now, I'm assuming here that the essence of temptation is that whatever it is is actually tempting to you. And I thought, well, what can I learn about each one of these that if I had actually paid attention a little sooner may have prepared me a little bit better for the ministry God had for me? Well, I looked at the first temptation, and it's very simple. He's been fasting for 40 days, and the Bible says he was hungry. Now, if you're looking for one of the top five funniest verses in Scripture, I frankly think this is a great candidate. Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and he was hungry. I would think so. I don't know if you've ever fasted before, right? but I can tell you one of the coolest things about fasting is that after you are done, food tastes really delicious. It's amazing how good something simple tastes. In fact, it would not surprise me if Jesus looked at that stone that the devil had turned him to turn in, told him, turn this thing into bread. It wouldn't surprise me if he looked at it and thought, it kind of actually looks a little like bread to me. If you've ever fasted, you kind of go through different seasons. When you first start fasting, you're very hungry quickly. And it's not, you're not actually really hungry. It's just that your body's so used to eating that your stomach is like a petulant child saying, it's time to eat, I want food now. And so you have what we call hunger pangs, but that's not really hunger. But if you fast for several days, it doesn't take long before you get to a point where your body's like, meh, okay, I won't eat. And you actually go for a, a pretty good season of time where hunger is not a, as big an issue. But by the time you get to day 21, your body begins to say, okay, it's getting serious. And your body lets you know there's real hunger at that point. By the time you get to day 40, the situation is very, very serious. It's a medical emergency. And so the enemy comes to him in this moment and says, Hey, if you're the Son of God, why don't you command these stones to become bread? And what is it about that moment? I think that first temptation is a temptation to the flesh. Now, there's, there's at least two, the, two different things that work here. I think the temptation of the flesh is one. The temptation probably is also for Jesus to sort of seize to sort of seize the control for himself rather than trusting God for his provision to say, I can do this, so I'm going to. The second temptation. The enemy takes him to the top of the, or the pinnacle, some translations say, of the temple and says, hey, if you're the son of God, why don't you jump off? Now, I don't know how you feel about heights, but this is not a tempting thing for me. I don't think to myself, oh, that sounds like a great idea. Uh, Josephus tells us that the, the likely place where they were on the southeast corner of the temple would have overlooked the Kidron Valley 450 feet below. Josephus writes that it was a dizzying height to look down from there. And the enemy says, why don't you just jump? Now, I, I can't imagine that the actual jumping itself and the impact seems like such a great uh, temptation, but what was it about that that would have been tempting? I mean, for one thing, it seems like if God would have come to Jesus' rescue in that moment... Doesn't it seem like it would have made ministry so much easier? And if you haven't been here yet, you're probably going to be at a place at some point or another in your life where you think, God, if you would just do this miracle, everybody would believe. God, if you would just come through for me right now, if you would just do this thing for me, if you would just heal this person, if you would just come through in this powerful way, then it would be so much easier, God. And that's the temptation here. The temptation is, Let's just have everybody see what happens. It's a temptation to fame. It's a temptation to be seen by all these people who are around the temple. Like, wow, he must be really special to God because look at the way he rescue, rescued him. And the third temptation is the temptation to the wide road. The enemy takes him to the top of a mountain and says, you see all these kingdoms in the world? If you bow down and worship me, I'll give them to you. Now, now, some people might read that text and say, now, wait a minute, why is the devil promising these things? They're not his to give, but in the temptation in Luke, the enemy specifically says, they have been given to me, and I can give them to anybody I want. He explains the dominion over this is, is mine to give to whoever I want. And, and certainly there is a theme through Scripture that this earth, there is a significant sense in which this earth is the dominion of the enemy. And he can give it to who, whom he wants. Now, why is this tempting to Jesus? I think it's tempting because it, it's, there's the temptation to do it the easy way. Because 
The desire of Jesus is to be the desire of the nations. And it is true that at the end of all days, that, that people from every tribe and every nation and every tongue, every language will bow down before the throne of God and worship him. But the way that Jesus has to go about this is the way of the cross. It's the hard way. It's the difficult way. It's the slow way. It's the way that requires a great deal of effort. And the temptation here is to bypass the cross and to short-circuit the path of obedience and to seize the role of son without accepting the role of servant. Now, I'm sure that I haven't grasped all that is involved in these temptations in the time that I've kind of surveyed them very quickly. But let me promise you this. If you are used by God to see that his kingdom comes and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven, I can assure you that you will face temptations to your flesh. They'll look different for different ones of you, but you will face those temptations. Whether they are physical, whether they are sexual, whatever it is, you will face those temptations. You will face the temptation to fame. I was at the same church in Roanoke, Virginia for over 17 years. And I can tell you there were times when I just thought, man, why am I not more popular? Why am I not getting offers from big mega churches? Why, why am I not being pulled to, you know, big stages where I can speak to lots and lots of people? Because all these people seem to think I'm really cool. And, wow, you're such a great speaker. Oh, you're the best I've ever heard, blah, blah, blah. And it massaged my ego and grew my pride. And the Lord knew I wasn't ready for a bigger platform because I was more interested in the platform and I was in the one to whom I was to bring glory. And I can assure you that whatever it is that you end up doing for the Lord, if you do anything at all, you will be tempted to take shortcuts. You will be tempted to pursue ways that allow you the quick fix, the easy solution, the bypass, obedience, and instead try to do it the easy way. And there's a reason why probably this is still on Jesus' mind when in the Sermon on the Mount he says there are two paths, there are two roads. One is narrow and difficult and leads to life. The other is broad. Many find it and it leads to destruction. Which road will you take? And if I only knew some of the things, some of those things years ago, I think maybe my ministry would have been more fruitful. There are a lot of things that I have learned too in the last couple of years about missions. Man, if I only knew, it might have not taken me until I was 45 years old to really get started with what I was going to do when I grew up. I think that's what I'm doing now. I'll let you know in a few more years. But I began to think, like, what are some things that I wish I knew about missions? Like, when, when, I, when I was sitting where you are now, what, what do I wish I knew? Well, I'll tell you the first thing I wish I knew when I was sitting where you are now. I wish I knew when I was where you are now, back in the... <laughs> I wish I knew that missions was not a department. When I was in college, I thought missions was a department. And I knew who the missions professor was. He was the most boring professor on campus. And I, who, I knew who the missions majors were. They were some of the weirdest people on campus. <laughs> and I knew I wasn't that. That's those people. I was a preaching and youth ministry guy. And I was very content to let them do their thing and let me do mine. Because I thought that missions was a department. And I've learned since then that the word missions comes from the Latin word missa. And it simply means sent. And so when you hear the word missions, the question that should occur to you is, which, not what department is that, but simply this. Where is God sending me? Where is God sending you? That's the only question. Because God has called you as you go to make disciples of all nations. The, sim the, the simple question is, where has he called you to do that? And my distinction between sort of the, the preaching thing in the local church and missions was shattered in part by Acts chapter 13. In Acts chapter 13, you have a picture there of the church at Antioch in the first five verses, and we're told about five different guys who were among those who were teachers and preachers there at that church, and they're named. And while they were worshiping one day, they were worshiping, they were fasting, and the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul. They're missionaries. But there was no separation. These were not different people. They didn't go to some different, different department. They didn't go to some different school. They just learned, and then they were sent where it was God wanted them to go. 
if I only knew. If I only knew when I was a youth minister that the mission of the church is the mission of the church. When you spend your life in ministry focused on students, it's really easy to get caught up in the roller coaster of their lives. There's all kinds of drama that goes on. Some of you are already involved in youth ministry now. You know what I'm talking about. Every day, like, there's these exhilarating highs and crushing lows, and there's all this drama going on in school. I've got two teenagers at home now. I feel like I'm a youth minister all over again. I had a 17-year-old and a 15-year-old. Wow. Moving on. Um, But when you get caught up in that mentality, when you begin thinking to yourself, I need to make sure these kids don't screw up life. It's it's really tempting to sort of get caught up in trying to make sure that they don't destroy themselves, that they don't do drugs, that they don't don't get too intimate with somebody that they're dating. You, You begin to focus more on the sin than you do on the mission. And the problem is, if you spend your life focusing on your sin, the focus of your life becomes your sin. If I only knew. And when I was in student ministry, it was really easy, particularly in the early years, to kind of get caught up in that, to kind of get caught up in a preservationist mentality. I just want these kids to survive. I just want these kids to make it, to graduate high school. I just want them not to destroy themselves in the meantime. And the problem is, when that's your focus, it becomes your focus. But God has given us a mission, and the best way to remain faithful to the Lord is to stay on mission is to remember that the mission of the church is the mission of the church, the larger mission. What I'm most proud of for my 17 plus years of ministry in southwestern Virginia is a week of camp called Teen Ministry Week. Teen Ministry Week was a week where students would come and instead of spending a week hearing great preaching about how they need to give up their sin and you know, come up and you know, write their sin on a piece of paper and nail it to a cross and, and cry a lot, which is not necessarily a bad thing, Instead, they came with a view to doing ministry. They came to the camp. They paid money so that they could come there and hop in a van and go serve at Habitat for Humanity or at a crisis pregnancy center or at a homeless shelter or at a food pantry or at the home of some dying woman who wanted her house clean before she died. And that's what they ended up doing. And what ended up happening is we we came to realize as a group that the more we spent our life focusing on God's larger mission. The more we spent our life focusing on what it was God wanted us to do, the more His Holy Spirit began to dwell richly and fill us and make it so that our sin was less of an issue. Some of you, that's what you need to hear right now. Because the focus of your life right now is your sin. It is defining you. It is what your life is about. Your life is about hiding it so that nobody knows about it. Your life is about trying to make more and more promises that you won't ever do it again. The focus of your life needs to be God's mission for your life. God, what do you want me to do with my life? And as you are on the way, then the Holy Spirit will begin the work in you to set you free from what it is that you are currently in bondage to. When we are on mission, God includes us in what he is doing. Are you living on mission? Are you just blowing time? Are you just hanging out? Are you just getting a degree? My life would have been different. If I only knew. If I only knew when I was a pastor that not all missions are created equal. We call a lot of stuff missions. I couldn't believe it. The first time I went to a missions meeting, there's all kinds of stuff in there. And I looked at it and I thought, Johnson Bible College, why is that part of our missions giving? And there's a whole list of things. Christian camp, why is that part of our missions giving? Now, you need to understand something. I'm a huge fan of giving to Johnson Bible College and the Blue Ridge Christian Camp and all those kinds of things. But they're really benevolence. And the church needs to be involved in those things. So don't go out of here and go to your church and say, hey, we don't need to give to Johnson anymore. That's not true. But what I am saying is not all missions are created equal. There's mission in the sense of things that go outside the church more broadly. And then there's mission as in What God has given the church to do that we have failed to do now for 2,000 years. In the last two plus years, I've had the opportunity to go to some pretty far-reaching places on the earth. I've traveled more in the last two and a half years than I did the entire 45 years of my life prior to that combined. And I can tell you that in some of the most unbelievably remote places on the planet, they have 
Coca-Cola. In some of the most far-reaching places in the middle of absolutely nowhere, they have cell phones. It's unbelievable. You wouldn't believe it. There's places that are hundreds of miles from the nearest toilet, but they have cell phones, all of them. It's amazing. I think to myself, how do they charge these things? And on the side of the road, they have these little shacks set up with a, with a portable generator, sometimes with a solar panel out there, and these huge strips right there that you just go and you plug your phone in for, you know, you just drop your phone off, you plug that thing in, you come back later after you've gone to the market, you pick up your phone and it's charged. Around the world, they know about McDonald's, they know about Coca-Cola, they know about cell phones, they have cell phones, but they don't have Jesus. Why not? Is it that the church didn't have a head start? Is it that we don't have enough money? It is that it is not our priority. That seeing that people to the ends of the earth who have never heard hear about Jesus is simply not that important to us. I wish I could say that it wasn't the case, but it is. And I want to invite you to be a part of changing that. Because 28% of the people on this planet still have no meaningful access to Jesus. There's a whole lot of statistics I could give you. Let me just give you this really fast because it's easy to get lost in all of this. In America right now, this is according to Christianity Today, professing Christians on average give 2.43% of their income in the United States. Around 28% of the world's population has not yet been reached by the gospel. Less than 1% of the money that goes into the local church, that is less than 1% of the 2.43% that the average Christian gives, that's given to the local church, goes to reaching this 28% of, of the people. And even among missionaries, only 3% of American cross-cultural workers serve the 28% of the people in the world who have never heard Jesus. If I only knew. I really didn't know. It was a distinction I really didn't have in my mind. Like, I guess sort of theoretically in the back of my mind, I thought to myself, there probably are people somewhere in the world that haven't heard about Jesus somewhere. But it was kind of like the Loch Ness Monster or Bigfoot. Like, people out, somebody's heard of them and somebody's seen them, but I haven't. It just wasn't real to me. Let me tell you, it's real. There are people in the world who haven't heard about Jesus. And Jesus wants to know, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? How is your ministry going to change that? How is God going to use you to make that different? And you're thinking to yourself, I'm one person. What can I do? And the answer is, not very much. That's the truth. You've been told otherwise ever since you were a little kid playing soccer out there. You can do anything. It's just not true. But God can do anything through you. And the truth is this, no snowflake thinks it's responsible for an avalanche. But everyone's required. Are you going to be part of it? Because it's going to happen. Are you going to be part of it is the only real question. If I only knew. If I only knew when I accepted this call to pioneer Bible translators that missionaries are people just like you and me. I used to think that missionaries were like different or something. I used to think, man, I used to think about the possibility of me being a missionary, and I, th and I thought, I actually said to God at one point, Lord, I will do anything you want me to do, but I will not raise support. I raise support now. I, and I used to say, God, I'll go anywhere you go, uh, anywhere you want me to go, as long as I don't have to go to Africa. Now I'm the West Africa branch chaplain. For Pioneer Bible Translators. <laughs> Missionaries, though, are people just like you and me. And I think part of what changed in this for me, now that I've been working with PBT for about two, two and a half years, is I've talked to so many of them. And they have, they're people who have fears just like you and me. They're people who have struggles just like you and me. They struggle with sin sometimes just like you and me. And I think one of the things that kind of changed my whole perspective on this is the realization that courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is when you are afraid, but you still choose to step toward the battle rather than away from it. That's real courage. 
And that's what missionaries are like. They feel fear. They feel sickness. They feel hurt. They feel anxiety. They struggle with sin. And one of the things that I think has helped many of them overcome that is something I've heard my buddy Nathan that I work in an office with at, at PBT. I've heard him say this over and over. You can endure almost any what as long as you have a big enough why. What is your why? What is your reason for doing what you do? Why are you here? As long as you really have a big enough why, you can endure almost any what. If I only knew. Well, I'll let the cat out of the bag. My best friend Steve Cook and I met in 1985. And uh, every year we celebrate our friend anniversary. <laughs> I'm not kidding. We usually actually celebrate at the melting pot right here in Knoxville. Sometimes when we go, the nature of our relationship is misunderstood. (laughs) I'm glad I get to leave at the end of this week. But I'm going to tell you that uh, there may be one or two people that you're sitting beside right now that are going to be friends for the rest of your life. And if they're spiritual peers, they're people that God is going to use to grow you. People that God is going to use to stretch you and make you a different person than you are right now. And it may be your boyfriend or girlfriend that's going to be your wife years from now, but it may also be your buddy or your friend that's sitting with you. And I can tell you that God has used Dr. Cook in many ways in my life. He's spoken many words of wisdom to me. He's spoken many things that have really made me stop and think, wow, I I need to remember that. One thing he said to me over 20 years ago is this. Wisdom is the ability to learn from the mistakes of others rather than having to make them all yourself. Wisdom is the ability to learn from the mistakes of others rather than having to make them all yourself. So my challenge to you is this. As I've been speaking, I've been saying things that, man... I think my ministry, my life could have been a little different if I only knew. And my prayer is, no, my trust, my belief is is that God chooses to use people like me and opportunities like this, sometimes in completely unintended ways. But if God has somehow or another spoken something to you, if something that you've heard has been relevant, something that you need to remember that could change your life if you only remembered, I would simply ask, would you learn from the mistake that I've made rather than having to make them yourself? Would you pray with me? Oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, be our guide. Father, move in us. Help us, Father, to have wisdom beyond our years. Help us rather than having to start back at ground zero, help us to stand on the shoulders of those who've gone before us, of these professors and these mentors that have that have given so much. Help us, Father, to stand on their shoulders that we might reach greater heights. Father, I pray that from the seed that's been sown this morning, I pray, Father, that much fruit would come. And I pray, Father, that from among this group that some would say with the Apostle Paul in Romans 15, my desire is not to build on another man's foundation, but to go where Christ has not yet been preached. And Father, those will lead us to some of the hardest, most difficult, trying places on the planet, But Father, would you give us the resources and the courage to step toward that battle rather than from it? In Jesus we pray. Amen.